What if Anakin Skywalker became the Emperor and Padme Amidala survived to lead the Rebellion? That's what I want to go over today. Had a lot of fun writing this, I hope you enjoy. And before we begin, real quick, I've partnered with Onasaber.com to host a giveaway for not one, but two sabers. I was extremely excited when Onasaber reached out, and we're working together for this giveaway. It's a giveaway that will run through this week, and the winners will be announced here on my channel next Monday. So one week from the date this was published. Here are the details of how to enter. Step 1. Hit the subscribe button on this channel. It's a giveaway that you have to be subscribed for, so only subscribers of the channel are eligible to win. Step 2. Click the link in the pinned comment down below to access the Google form for the giveaway. Fill that out and you're all set. Huge shout out to Onasaber for working on this with me. They also have an amazing Black Friday special going on this month by any replica saber and get a free Padawan saber. Simply add both to your cart and get the Padawan saber automatically free at checkout. The link to the website also in the pinned comment. Check it out, you won't regret it. Once again, both winners announced in one week. Check the pinned comment. Alright, so yeah, sign up for that. It's, you know, great deal. So let's get right into today's video. On Mustafar, Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi met blades next to the Lake of Lava. This was not Jedi against Sith. It was not light against dark or good against evil. It had nothing to do with duty or philosophy, religion or morals. This was Anakin against Obi-Wan, personally. Just the two of them, and the damage that they had done to each other. Blade to blade, they were identical. After thousands of hours of lightsaber sparring, they knew each other better than brothers, more intimately than lovers. They were complementary halves of a single warrior. In every strike, Obi-Wan gave ground. It was his way, and he knew to strike Anakin down would burn his own heart to ash. And after so long, Obi-Wan had his own opening, but missed. You hesitate, growled Anakin, the flaw of compassion. And Obi-Wan replied, it's not compassion, it's reverence for life. Even yours. It's respect for the man you were. Regret for the man you should have been. And Anakin flew forward, screaming in anger that he was sick of these lectures. Obi-Wan flipped backwards, landing on a floating platform away from the lava fall near them. And Obi-Wan saw a new opening. Anakin's platform was crackling, floating to the lava fall. And with a quick flick of his wrist, Obi-Wan caught Anakin off guard, shattering his platform. And Anakin fell on his back, unable to recover as what remained of his platform fell far down below the lava fall. Obi-Wan watched him fall and muttered, Goodbye, old friend, before going to find Padme and get out of here. Anakin Skywalker was dead. But Darth Vader was not. The platform landed far below on the lava, and Vader was lucky enough to land on it, feeling a crack in his bones. But he stabbed his lightsaber into it to avoid falling into the lava, and as he landed, some of the lava sprayed up, burning into his skin. He screamed in agony, but he was still well alive enough to pull himself safely to the hot ground. The lava was searing into him, and in order to pull himself safely to the hot ground, he had to use the force, getting himself to the platform, getting himself to the side of the lava where he was able to climb up and then follow his path back to a hot rock wall, climbing it while burning his hands on every limb. He would find Obi-Wan, he would finish this, he would find Padme and get her back. But he finally reached the top, sprinting to the landing platform. As he got there, he saw Padme's ship leave the atmosphere. They were gone. He was left behind. Alone. Padme clearly hated him. Obi-Wan hated him. They thought he was dead. The galaxy hated him. So be it. He would rule alone. He didn't need anyone. And speaking of which, Anakin saw a new ship now. Emperor Palpatine was arriving, and his ship set down on Mustafar. Anakin watched as Palpatine and a squad of Coruscant guard troopers descended the ramp. Darth Sidious looked to his new apprentice, Darth Vader, as he was pacing the landing platform, staring daggers at the Dark Lord. And Sidious felt true fear, more than he felt fighting Yoda, even more than he felt fighting Windu. Vader has reached his full potential, and Sidious felt that Vader was no longer conflicted in any way. He was set on revenge, and that revenge started with Sidious. Perhaps the apprentice requires one last lesson, thought Sidious. And so Sidious walked up to Vader, outstretching his hands to fire lightning, but nothing came out. Vader stood staring at Sidious, eyes burning yellow, as he used the force to keep the lightning from shooting out. 
and because the lightning never left Sidious' hands, it slowly burned up inside of the Sith Lord. Sidious looked down as blue tendrils spread throughout his own hands, burning his hands off as he started to burn from the inside out completely. Vader was controlling the lightning inside of him, using all of his rage. And Sidious gave one final look of fear before the lightning spread to his entire body, burning him to the ground. The Coruscant Guard Troopers took aim at Vader, but the new Dark Lord of the Sith pulled their weapons to him, saying that they were not in danger. They're simply under new rule. The rule of Emperor Vader. The troopers looked around, then saluted to Vader. It was time for a new era. And across the galaxy, on a medical facility on Polis Massa, Padme Amidala gave birth to twins. As she did, she could feel her life fading, but as she closed her eyes for perhaps the final time, she heard the cries of her children. Her children. She could not die here. The galaxy has been ripped apart, rebuilt under tyranny. Everything she stood for was ruined, but perhaps, if she survives, she can lead the galaxy back to true peace under democracy. And so Padme Amidala held on to her life, eventually recovering to hold her children as she went over next steps with Bail Organa and Obi-Wan Kenobi. A bit later, the newly formed Imperial Senate was curious as to where Emperor Palpatine had gone. The Empire was just formed, but for some reason he was nowhere to be found. The galaxy was kept in the dark except for a few key members of the Empire. Wilhuff Tarkin, Mas Amida, Wilhuff Yularen, Sly Moore, Sait Prestage, and Orson Krennic were called to the office of the Emperor, and all of them showed up to find the seat turned away, facing Coruscant. They all took seats at the desk, and finally the chair turned. But it was not Darth Sidious sitting there. Instead, it was Anakin Skywalker, Jedi Hero of the Republic. Everyone immediately got more tense, but Anakin told them to stay calm and Anakin detailed what happened on Mustafar and what would happen from here. He was the new emperor, but these six people would help him rule. Anakin was no fool. He was not built right now to run an empire alone. He needed this group, and they were all absolutely willing to handle this. Tarkin would help handle military, Yularen the ISB, Krennic would handle fleets along with super weapons, while Masamita, Slymour, would work together to handle the citizens and senate. They all agreed, and the Imperial Council was formed, and Anakin wanted to hunt down Jedi. He didn't necessarily want to rule constantly. Politics were not for him. But everything would still go through him. Another reason Anakin did this was to focus on what he cared about, the Jedi. He knew Yoda was alive, Obi-Wan was alive, and it could only be inferred that there were so many other survivors. Not enough to cause any immediate threat to Imperial rule, but enough to build up over time. Anakin would not let that happen, and so for the next three years, the Empire grew, and Jedi died. Anakin and the newly formed Inquisitorius killed surviving Jedi, Luminara Unduli, Serjunda Jocastanu, Apple Rancis, Coleman Cage, Eeth Koth, and so many others. Every day, a new Jedi seemed to be killed, and Anakin was feared around the galaxy. And one day, he tracked a group of Jedi younglings into a hidden Jedi temple on Lothal. Inside the temple, Anakin snuck through it, trying to find the Jedi, and he came upon one of them talking to... Yoda? Somehow, Yoda was doing a projection of some sort, and Yoda from Dagobah was able to communicate with Jedi that were inside of Jedi temples if the connection was strong enough. But today, Yoda watched with his own eyes as the Wookiee youngling had his voice caught in his throat and a moment later was cut down by Anakin. Yoda simply looked up at Anakin, with sadness in his eyes. The Chosen One, the greatest failure of the Jedi Order. Yoda's failure, or so he took it upon himself. And Yoda faded away from the temple. Anakin used the Force to crumble this Jedi Temple to the ground. The dark side of the Force had never been stronger. But the Light was not dead. Not yet. And so over these now five years, seeds of a rebellion were planted at the beginning, and the seeds had now grown to a legitimate rebellion, with Padme Amidala at the center of it. When the Republic fell, Padme worked with Bail and Obi-Wan to figure out the best path forward. A fake funeral was held for her, where she and Bail ended up finding Ahsoka and a few other allies for their cause. From there, Ahsoka got Captain Rex on board, and the rebellion recruited clone troopers that had their chips removed or Order 66 had just worn off. 
the clone uprising and the rebellion joined forces with Ahsoka and Obi-Wan helping lead the growing military. It was hard to stay hidden, but they often move and now had found a permanent base on the salty planet of Crate. Luke and Leia were now five years old and were being taken care of greatly. Padme Amidala even began training in martial arts herself as well as blaster fire. She had a deep sadness, a deep anger of her own that she would take out in this training. The hardest part of growing this rebellion was the early revelation that her husband, Anakin Skywalker, was not only alive, but he was the Emperor, and the Holonet would often describe new Jedi that were slain by Anakin and the Empire. Her husband was gone, and so she accepted it. And today, Padme was sitting in a meeting with the Rebellion Council that now included Bail Organa, Mon Mothma, Ahsoka Tano, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Captain Rex. Padme was the official leader of this council, but today it was Rex who did the talking. He said that the number of clones in this rebellion was growing, and oftentimes these clones would detail what was going on within the Empire. It was usually all the same, planets undergoing extreme changes to serve the Empire, citizens being recruited, aka forced to work for the Empire, or lose everything. But today, news was much different. The Empire had a super weapon. In secret, over these five years, the Empire had secretly rebuilt a weapon from the Clone Wars that had killed so many. It was called the Malevolence, and once it fired its ion cannon, it completely shut down enemy ships and all technology it came into contact with. Anakin Skywalker helped destroy it during the Clone Wars, and Clone Intelligence reported that the weapon was back and preparing to take off into space in a couple of days from the planet of Corellia. The entire Rebellion Council already knew what Padme was about to say. It was time for the Rebellion to officially make itself known. The Empire would never expect this big of a military, likely around 5,000 troopers, counting clones and recruits to emerge with this ambush. They would be led by Padme, Obi-Wan, Rex, and Ahsoka, and they would destroy this weapon, bring proof of it around the galaxy, recruiting more and more members to their cause. Later that same day, Anakin sat in a meeting with the Imperial Council. Everything was going as they'd planned. The real, all-new malevolence was in orbit, ready to jump to hyperspace when needed. Tarkin and Krennic detailed everything they knew about the Rebellion that there were now only rumors about, and Anakin listened carefully. He had hoped that tracking down and killing Jedi would eventually lead him to Kenobi, and perhaps Padme. He didn't buy the funeral, he didn't believe she was truly dead, he knew she might be out there. But it had just not gone well. He couldn't find them anywhere. No matter how many Jedi he tracked down, he could never find them. But he knew if anyone were to be leading a rebellion, it would be his old master and his wife. This pesky rebellion had evaded the Empire for too long, and soon they would be wiped out. The Council had spent every day for the last few years trying to track them down, and perhaps they finally had the rebellion right where they wanted them and Anakin went on to meditate in the Force, feel the darkness coursing through him, but today in his meditation, he felt something new, something familiar, something he felt in the Jedi Temple that he destroyed recently. Yoda. Somehow he could feel Yoda, and Yoda was calling to him, like a guide of some sort. Anakin knew this had to be unintentional, but he must take the opportunity. So Anakin told the Council that he would be ready to fight if the Rebellion soon shows itself, but he has other duties to attend to right now. And so Anakin took off in a starfighter, letting the Force guide him. After a while, he emerged above a green, swampy planet that was strong in the light side of the Force, and Anakin could absolutely feel that Yoda was here. Anakin descended down through the Dagobah swamps, using the Force to guide him through the terrible visibility, and he landed down in an open area. Anakin got out and walked for quite a while before finally coming upon a log where he found him, Yoda, seated alone, and he looked up to greet Anakin. But Anakin drew his now crimson red lightsaber, and Yoda simply waved his hand like he did not want to fight. Instead, the old Grand Master spoke to Anakin, saying that he is dying sooner than he would like. Any day now would be his last. Anakin could see and feel it now. Yoda was weak, old truly on his final days. He was no threat, so Anakin put his lightsaber away and asked why Yoda called him here. Yoda went on, apologizing for everything Anakin has become, saying Qui-Gon felt some responsibility, and he did as well. 
Anakin was angry now. How did he know what Qui-Gon felt? And he didn't want this pity. He was not anyone's failure. He didn't have time for this. So once again, he ignited his saber and asked Yoda why he was called here. Yoda tapped his stick on the ground, then gave a faint smile, telling Anakin that it was actually Obi-Wan who requested this. Obi-Wan wanted Anakin here, so Anakin could not interfere with what was coming next. And now, Anakin understood. This was simply a distraction. The Imperial Council was right. The Rebellion was emerging. Anakin had to get to the Malevolence immediately. And so Yoda closed his eyes as Anakin swung at him, cutting him down on Dagobah, as he took off to the shipyards on Jakku, where the Malevolence was waiting. Obi-Wan and Padme looked out of the window as the Rebellion fleet emerged from hyperspace above Corellia. They had coordinates to the superweapon, and the Imperial blockade was taken by complete surprise. In a matter of minutes, the Rebel fleet was able to push through. Thousands of troopers were on the ground in minutes. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka led attack groups that contained clones, recruits, Rex, and Padme. And for a few hours, the Battle of Corellia would commence, and the Empire was not taking this shipyard security lightly. They had stormtroopers everywhere, along with AT-ATs, ATSTs ready to go, but the sheer number of rebellion troopers allowed them to push through. There were many casualties, and after a long fight, Padme, Obi-Wan, Rex, and Ahsoka got to the control room, pushing through more security forces until they reached the Hidden Away base. Inside of it was a huge ship with a giant ion cannon on the side. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka guarded the entrance to the base, while Padme and Rex worked on disabling it. But after a few minutes, Padme turned to the Jedi and was lost for words. The ship inside of the base was completely inactive. There were no records of construction, no records of it ever being used. It was like it had no use at all, like it couldn't even be turned on. It was like it was only here to draw in the rebellion. And Obi-Wan felt all of his hope disappear as he looked up to the sky. Emerging from hyperspace, the real malevolence, twice the size of the one they were looking at. The rebellion had fallen for a trap. In space, Anakin looked at the rebellion fleet destroying his imperial fleet, and he smiled. This was a small price to pay for the destruction of the Rebellion. Recently, the Imperial Council had come up with this expert plan. They built two Malevolence ships, the real one that Anakin was in, and then just the inactive shell of another stored away down on Corellia. From there, the Council planted evidence that was easy for Imperial defectors to access of the ship being on Corellia. It was too good of an opportunity to pass up for the Rebels. They were blinded by their need to destroy the Empire and now they would die. Anakin gave the signal, and the Malevolence fired. The rebel fleet was trapped, and Bail Organa, Mon Mothma, along with countless other rebel leaders, were sitting ducks inside of their ships. The Ion Cannons destroyed their shields, shut down their ships completely, and now the Malevolence used its cannons to completely blow up the fleet. Obi-Wan, Padme, Ahsoka, and Rex were ordering a complete evacuation down on the surface, but it was hard to organize, as the Rebellion was still fighting head-on with the Empire. And after a bit, Obi-Wan looked to space again. The Malevolence was charged back up, and it fired down to the ground. The Jedi, Padme, Rex got back into the base just in time. But everyone else was caught in the blast. Communicators and guns of every single fighter down below were disabled, and once again the Malevolence fired everything it had at the ground. Clones and other fighters were quickly wiped out. It was complete destruction, and smoke filled the air. Ahsoka and Obi-Wan watched something drop from the sky and land in the middle of the smoke with an impact that sent troopers flying through the air. And the remaining troopers approached the smoke, trying to find out what just landed, and a red lightsaber flew through the air, cutting down hundreds of troopers in under a minute, flying through, guided by the Force. And as the smoke finally cleared, the lightsaber was called back to its owner. Darth Vader stood in the middle of the Fallen Rebellion. No one was left standing, except for the four people that made it inside of the base. The Rebellion was completely ambushed and wiped out, except for the leadership, and so Anakin looked to the base, moving towards it, ready to face and destroy his past. In moments, the air was crackling with tension of lightsabers as the Sith Emperor Anakin faced his former allies in a confrontation that would echo through the galaxy. 
Captain Rex, Anakin's clone captain through the war, stood tall, his armor battered, as he held his blaster up. Ahsoka Tano, Padawan of Anakin, stood by Rex's side, her lightsabers illuminating the surroundings. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin's master, surveyed the scene with a heavy heart, understanding the gravity of the situation. And Padme Amidala, the wife of Anakin, stood behind them, eyes filled with sadness and determination. Anakin, now consumed by the dark side, advanced with purpose, his crimson lightsaber casting an eerie glow across the room. He could feel the pull from the light, but that pull would disappear if he could just kill his past here and now. Perhaps the four most influential people in his life stood in front of him. And without a word, the clash of lightsabers reverberated through the base as Rex rolled away, blaster bolts deflecting off of Anakin's wielded weapon. A deflected blast hit Rex in the mask, so he took it off and turned back to fire at Anakin again. But it was too late. Anakin leapt at Rex through the air, and the two made eye contact one final time as Anakin cut down the clone captain. Then, he pushed Obi-Wan away, engaging Ahsoka. Ahsoka was trying to avenge the memory of her former mentor, engaging Anakin in a heartbreaking duel. Their lightsabers moved through the air, the room filled with the hum of energy. Ahsoka's determination was bright, but Anakin's dark side was too much. In a moment of destiny, Anakin struck down Ahsoka, her lightsabers falling silent as she collapsed to the ground. Memories of Ahsoka and everything she was to Anakin flooded to the surface, nearly breaking the Sith Lord. But he pushed the memories away as Obi-Wan got to him. And Obi-Wan was grief-stricken. He was anguished. Stepping forward now to avenge his fallen friends, including Anakin. And their duel was constant, even strikes and parries, each move infused with years of training. Obi-Wan pleaded with Anakin to remember himself, to reject the darkness. But Anakin's heart remained hardened. It was far too late. He was doing what he must do. And finally, he disarmed Kenobi, stabbing him in the gut. Obi-Wan even saw a tear in Anakin's eye, like the light was just begging to get out. But suddenly, a blaster bolt hit Anakin in the face. It grazed his scarred side, and he was holding it as another bolt hit Anakin in the leg, then another on his shoulder. Padme. And Anakin fell behind a box for cover, holding his eye as Padme came around the corner to see him. She held up her blaster again, face determined with what she had to do. But before she could pull the trigger, a blue lightsaber flew through the air, cutting her in half. The last words from Padme's mouth were, I hate you, as she fell dead. The room fell silent, except for the heavy breathing of the Sith Emperor and the echoes of the battle that had raged within these walls. The heroic Jedi Knight, now Sith Lord, his heart devoid of light, forever haunted by the memory of the lives he just extinguished in this descent of battle. Anakin walked out of the room and used the Force to crumble the base, leaving this part of him behind forever. And the Empire would reign supreme, with the threat of rebellion wiped out. Soon after the battle, the location of the rebel base was revealed, and the Empire stormed it to wipe out any last remnants. Anakin led the charge, and when it was over, he walked through the base, until eventually he heard whispering, and felt a strong presence in the Force. No, two strong presences. Anakin moved quickly now, ripping open a door to reveal two young children being cared for by an older woman. And Anakin killed the woman, feeling into the Force. With these children, he felt Padme, himself. He couldn't believe it. Anakin had found his children, and he took them with him back to Coruscant. Having his children around him helped him stay sane. The rule of two would work itself out eventually, as both children would train in the dark side of the Force, becoming the most powerful trio the galaxy had ever seen. And folks, that's where our story ends today. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Thanks for watching. Be sure to enter the giveaway, and I'll see you in the next video.